Is gold really an effective inflation hedge? That is the thematic question we'll be asking Jeff Christian, managing partner of the CPM Group today, as well as his outlook on the PGM Group. Jeff, welcome back to the show. Hey, it's good to be back. Tomorrow, Tuesday, CPI comes out. Uh, monthly CPI data is released tomorrow, and we'll be following that closely to follow up on where inflation stands and is potentially headed down the line. But first, before we discuss inflation and your macroeconomic outlook, let's talk about gold. Now, as you know, it's no surprise to anybody watching the show that gold is well regarded by many gold investors and silver investors alike to be an excellent inflation hedge, or at least that's the story. Let's take a look at what the data actually tells us. So I've done some number crunching on my own, Jeff. Let's take a look at this chart. And this is a chart I've put together. What I've done here is I've rebased the gold price and the CPI index as supplied by the uh, St. Louis Fed data to 1980. The start of 1980, I've rebased both series to 100 to make it an even starting point. And this chart shows uh, how much they've grown relative to each other. If you were to buy something in 1980, assuming it grew at the pace of CPI inflation, it would be worth roughly 3.5 times its nominal value today than in 1980. And so would gold be if you just if you were to just look at this chart. Okay, so if you were to take this chart and just look at it from a 41 gear time horizon perspective, you could make the argument that yes, gold in the long term is an excellent store of value and hedge against inflation because it's exactly caught up with the CPI. How would you respond to that? And how would you interpret this chart? Well, the way to look at this, I think, is that you can see there are six months in which gold and CPI on a rebased basis uh, cross with each other. So if you have 492 year months in a 41-year period, and you've got six months where gold has played catch up uh, to inflation or actually three months in which it's played catch up and three months in which it's fallen down to the inflation figure. And the other 486 months, you have gold either, you know, a couple times overperforming inflation, if you will, and most of the time uh, underperforming inflation. So that tells yeah. you that gold is good as a long-term protector of value, but it doesn't protect you from that gnawing 2% year-in, year-out inflation, which really destroys purchasing power. So if you look at this from 1980 until, you know, what, 2009, 2010, if you thought that you could buy gold and that gold purchasing power was always going to be equal to what it was in January 1980, you would have been sorely wrong for that entire period from 1980 to 2010, right? True. It played catch up in 2009 and 10, actually exceeded it for a few months, like about 24 months, and then came back down. So gold is a good preserver of value and a portfolio diversifier. It helps you preserve your wealth, but you shouldn't expect it to move lockstep with inflation, which I think is probably very important to your wanting to talk about the CPI numbers that come out tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. And let's go back to the period in the early 2000s when gold had a huge run up. Can you just summarize why we've had such a enormous rally in that decade? Because the CPI index, I'm looking at the blue line here, the slope of that index didn't significantly increase. In other words, we didn't have enormous amounts of inflation in the early 2000s. So what drove the gold price up? Yeah, gold wasn't playing catch up with inflation from 2000 to 2011. Gold was responding to other factors. You know, and specifically, if you go back into that 80s and 90s, that was a period of very strong stock markets, very high bond interest rates until 93, 94, uh, very strong economic growth, uh, relatively good, you know, low inflation. And gold simply was sidelined because those factors that drive investors into gold were not compelling. But in 1997 to 2000, you had the new economic paradigm where all these people were saying inflation was dead. We'd never have another recession. The Dow Jones was going to 40,000 uh, in any month now. And, and you had this 
concept of the new economic phenomena, uh, a paradigm. It was similar to commodity super cycles and, and other things. And you had a tech stock boom. And people were rushing money into that. And then it blew up 2000, 2001. The Dow Jones, uh, the New York Stock Exchange fell 46%. The NASDAQ fell 86%. Uh, you know, and all of a sudden people said, gee, maybe the new economic paradigm was just a marketing hype from Wall Street. And maybe we're still having, going to have recessions. We went into a recession. We had all kinds of bankruptcies. You had all kinds of financial scandals. And people start saying, maybe it makes sense to have some of my wealth in gold to protect myself from this whole array of financial and economic uh, maladies that can affect my, 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 my wealth. Never mind inflation. Inflation was neutral throughout this, as you can see from this chart. But all these other factors were coming home to roost. That started investors buying gold. Then we had 9-11. Then we had the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Then we had or in Afghanistan. Then we had the U.S. invasion of Iraq. You had oil prices go from $10 to $150 and then back down to $30 and then back up to $90. You had all kinds of other factors other than inflation causing investors to say, I want to have some of my wealth in gold. And that's what was going on. If you take a look at periods of actual high inflation, for example, the early 80s, we had the CPI index rise from 100 to 150 points in this chart from the beginning of 1980 to 1988, 1989. So that's a 50, basically roughly a 50% increase in your broad uh, basket of goods over just a seven to eight year time span which is quite significant for the U.S. Yet during that time period, gold actually went the opposite way. Not only did it not outcompete inflation, it, uh, it lost value in the 80s. Why is that? Well, a couple things, you know, and, and that's what exactly what I was saying earlier. Gold does not do well to protect you from that gnawing 2% annual year in, year out inflation that destroys a consumer's purchasing power. Now, what you had were a couple of things. First off, gold prices starting in 1980 is kind of unfair, and, and economists would use a rolling average on this uh, because 1980 was a year in which gold prices rose from like $190 the year before to an average price of like $612. Uh, so okay. you had very high gold prices in 1980, and the gold market reacted by increasing production, reducing fabrication demand, investors who had bought high, sold low, and the gold price came down over that period of time, in part because inflation also was coming down. It doesn't show up here, but if you had gone back to the 1970s, you would have seen, you know, 5% inflation, 7% inflation, 14% inflation at the end of 1979. So when you start seeing this 2% inflation rate in the 80s, that actually was a sharp reduction in inflation. And as I said, you had a, a number of other factors that were going on that caused investors to say gold doesn't make sense, especially at $600, especially at $300. And the price came down and it traded around $320, $360 for, you know, you can see on this chart for an extended period of time. Sure. And would you make the argument or the statement rather that gold does very well during periods of very high inflation? Yes. I mean, it takes U.S. CPI over 7% to really see. see gold kick in and, and people pouring into the gold market as an inflation hedge. That's why but, all these hypesters keep talking about how hyperinflation has, has got to come along because they're trying to sell gold based on fear. Well, let me, let me provide a counter argument to, uh, to that statement, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're right. Gold has historically done well in periods of very high inflation, but that argument could be applied to any other investable asset. Most assets have done well during periods of inflation, real estate, stocks. Yeah. I mean, there were certain periods where stocks you know, lost out to inflation. Uh, so that, yeah, gold was not the only thing that performed very well during periods of high inflation is what I'm saying. Yeah, there, you can pick any asset and you can find, you know, with gold silver ratio, oh, well, the gold silver ratio averages, you know, pick a number, whatever it is, you know, 60 over the last 40 years. And that's a meaningless number in terms of the last 60 years. It's only been there for like eight times over those, you know, over those 40 years. So you can find all kinds of stuff. You know, you can find the, car, the cost of new cars and you can see that sometimes it plays uh, catch up with inflation and sometimes it doesn't. 
Well, housing, the same way. Yeah. So you can take any asset and you can play with that. The thing is that most assets don't lend themselves to being portfolio asset diversifiers and portable investments the way gold and silver are. Okay. So that, that you think would be the true purpose of gold to diversify uh, against market volatility. Yeah, okay. gold, gold's cool because it doesn't react just to inflation. It also reacts to currency markets, it reacts to real and nominal interest rates. It reacts to political events, to stock market conditions, to overall economic conditions. You know, when you look at our econometric model for gold pricing, it's got all that stuff thrown in there. There's a tremendous mm-hmm. amount of things that affect gold, which makes okay. it so interesting, including politics. So let's 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 end this segment on gold on your outlook. We've discussed this before. I know you think there's an affl- there's going to be another recession uh, happening down the line in two to three years time. Going back to your economic um, your economic model for gold, which of these variables that you've listed geopolitical risks, uh, equities volatility, inflation, which of these variables are rated or weighted higher in your model? I'm not quite sure statistically what it is, but I think probably real interest rates. Is is one of the major factors. Uh, that's probably the biggest one. Okay, and so your gold outlook then, given uh, given your outlook on the economy. Our gold outlook is that the price basically treads water. We're a little bit concerned on a very short term basis that the market could have a measured move and take a spike down yet in July. But we think by the you know in a week or two we're going to be seeing the August COMEX roll. And, and the gold price will be supported by people buying 39 million ounces of August contracts and rolling them forward into October and December. Uh, so our expectation is that the price kind of treads water for the second half of the year. 2022, we expect the gold price to move up, move up modestly. And then at some point, possibly 2023, 2024, at some point, we think you're going to see another uh, increased financial stress maybe another financial crisis. Uh, Political problems will probably deteriorate further, both domestically within the United States, Europe, and China. Uh, And and you you could also see um, a a stock market correction. And so we think there will be a combination of financial and economic and political factors that could drive the gold price sharply higher at some point. But it's probably, in our view, it's not imminent. You know, those guys who are saying, oh, you know, the U.S. government's going to have a, a currency reset or the IMF is going to crash the dollar or you better take uh, if you have more than five thousand dollars in the bank, you better take it out because on any given date, uh, the government's going to come in and take it. You, that's that's all nonsense. And, you know, we do think that there'll be a, a recession. We do think there'll be financial problems, but we think that the real problems lie beyond 2022. OK, uh- well, since you brought it up, Jeff, let's address these lower probability events, shall we call them? And uh, let's just let's just let's just humor them for for a minute here. <laughs> Suppose we do have some sort of currency reset. Suppose we do have the IMF confiscating dollars. Would that actually have any impact on gold? Where can we expect to see the gold price headed in response to such a scenario, if hypothetically speaking, they were to occur? That's the not. That's the wrong question. Because the idea of the IMF confiscating dollars is not a legitimate, you know, it has zero probability. If you know anything about international economics, about the IMF and about currencies, you know that's got zero probability. You know, the key question is what happens if there are other economic factors that are very critical? I mean, anybody who's telling you that the IMF is going to confiscate dollars is speaking from a position of trying to scare you into buying gold. Yeah, you know, there's zero probability. Well, shouldn't shouldn't investors uh, start? You know, given given what we've experienced over the last year, right, with COVID, with the pandemic, mm-hmm. with the global shutdown, with the capital being stormed, these are all. If you ask me, if I asked you these, you know, the, about these things, maybe two or three years ago, you probably would have said these are very very low probability, if not zero probability events as well. Shouldn't investors at least consider tail risks? Actually, that's a very good question because. If you had asked me that question two or three years ago about any of those factors, I would have said these are issues that would cause me concern that are causing me concern two or three years ago and causing other people concerns. And you should probably be buying gold and having some of your wealth stored in gold against these things happening. I mean, there were any number of people. The, the White House had 
a task force looking at the next pandemic until 2017, when the Trump administration denied it. Everybody in that industry, the medical profession and epidemiology profession, knew that there was coming going to be more pandemics, right? So the probability of a pandemic was probably about 100%. And people who were intelligent and informed about this were working to protect themselves and their societies against it. You know, that is radically different from saying, oh, the IMF, which has no capacity to confiscate dollars, is going to confiscate your dollars. Yeah, that's an improbability because the mechanics are not there. A really interesting one is, you know, January 6th. You know, think about the scenario in which that occurred. First off, a lot of people were predicting it. I even had some bets out against people with, with, with people who thought that not only would it occur, but it would succeed. But let's define a success. Let's say that these guys had succeeded in taking control of the Capitol. Maybe they hung Mike Pence. Maybe they you know, handcuffed various uh, Congress people and were holding them for kangaroo trials. And the army, the army showed us something very important. There has been for 40 years a debate among informed sources about what happens if there's a right wing insurrection attempt in the United States. Would the army defend the Constitution or would they side with the right wingers? And the U.S. brass, the you know the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and a large part of the Pentagon are very much concerned, and they're doing all these studies. What you know, what portion of our troops will defend the Constitution, and what portion might side with insurrectionists? And that's been a question that's been front and center within the Pentagon in various studies for decades, right? And we had a little test on January sixth. And the military came down on the side of the revolution, uh, on the constitution, came down on the side of the constitution against the insurrectionists. So let's go back to a scenario where the insurrectionists actually succeed in storming and taking control of the, the capital. And then the military comes in and let's have a shootout. And there are umpteen people lined up with, you know, ri ribbons tying their hands behind their back uh, on, on the lawn in front of the capital. And you have a trial for treason. I mean, that is a more likely scenario and say, uh, you know, the Treasury going into your bank and taking all but $5,000 out of any account. And consider that. I mean, most people who have $5,000 or more in their bank accounts, you know, most of the money in bank accounts is the 1%. They just don't well. You think that the government is going to go against the 1% that supports them? Yeah. So the, so the likelihood of a civil war in that scenario is, is very small, is what you're saying. I think the likelihood of political violence is greater in the United States today than it has been at any period of time, probably since the 1930s, when you had the America First movement, which was saying we should you know, side with the Nazis and break our relations with the French and the British. Uh, and we should install a, a nationalist socialist government uh, in the United States. And their slogan was make America great again. And that dissipated really, really with the onset of World War II. I mean, it, it was a very vir virulent strain of fascism from 1936 onward. And Huey Long, who was actually a radical Democrat, uh, but, you know, it was a form of fascism there. So I think that we've got a greater chance of political violence in the United States today than at any time since the 1930s. And I think that, you know, the, the Pentagon looks that way. The Justice Department looks at it that way. Yeah. Reasonable people look at that and say that's a real risk. The risk of a civil war succeeding is very low. Okay. Well, let's factor all these risks in and talk about investment implications. We've talked about your outlook for gold. Let's talk about your outlook for PGM, the Platinum Group Metals. So given that you think the risk of an insurrection and a civil war is non-zero, let's talk about PGMs. Are they even related? Why? Give us the investment case for buying PGMs. You have a yearbook coming out tomorrow, by the way. The PGM yearbook 2021 edition. It comes out yearly on an annual basis from the CPM Group. What can we expect to learn? 
Well, the yeah, PGM markets are smaller than gold and silver, and they have even more misinformation possibly circulating. So CPM group, you know, we've been writing about PGM since the 1970s, uh, you know, and throughout our period at J. Aaron and Goldman Sachs, and then, you know, in the 35 years that we've been independent at CPM group. So we've been writing about this stuff ever since. And, and you know, our data goes back to 1976. So we will have a very sober, analytical, dispassionate view of platinum, palladium, and rhodium. We have a little bit of text on like three pages on, on iridium, ruthenium, and osmium at the back, but it's the three major markets. And these metals primarily, they're, they're, the vast majority of their metal is used in auto catalysts. Auto catalysts got hit, you know, auto demand got hit very hard last year by the economic lockdown. And then this year it's being restrained by the shortage of semiconductor chips that's reducing auto production. So you're seeing it a little bit there. But just going to the specific metals very quickly, platinum has been very weak from 2015 until the end of 2019. It started to revive late last year. It got over a thousand. It was trading basically between 800 and a thousand dollars for most of the period 2015 through 2019, really into the fourth quarter of 2020. In the fourth quarter, it broke above a thousand. In the first quarter of this year, it, it, it went even higher. It's about a hundred, a one thousand one hundred and twenty dollars today. Our expectation is that the price moves sideways the rest of this year, but starts moving higher because we think that the platinum market is looking a lot more attractive. Now, palladium has done the exact opposite. It's moved to from record price to record price over the period, say, 2016 to 2019. And it's trading about $2,800, $2,900 an ounce now, close to its record prices of around $3,000. We don't see it falling because we think that the demand will stay high, both from in fabricators and also we think that you're seeing some rejuvenation of investor demand. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't see, so we don't see the palladium price continuing to rise as sharply as it has been over the last five, six years, but we do see it staying high. Rhodium prices went parabolic. They went from, you know, $2,000 to $4,000 to $30,000, and now they're down to around $15,000, $16,000. Uh, but we don't see them going back to $4,000 or $2,000 because there's a fundamental tightness in the rhodium market, and we just don't think there's the above-ground inventories that could support the kind of persistent demand that you've had uh, deficit uh, that you've had for the last 40 years. So we think that rhodium prices will have to stay very high. It's interesting how uh, rhodium prices have a similar volatility profile to Bitcoin and actually has a similar growth profile as well. If you take a look at the prices <laughs> that you've just mentioned, yet it's covered uh, it's gotten less media attention. Used. <laughs> Rhodium's used in automobiles and you gotta, you know, you gotta have Let's, rhodium if you're going to sell yeah. a car. Let's talk about the car industry now. Uh, supply crunch with the uh, chip shortage, supply mm -hmm. crunch with the auto industry as a whole. That's why we've seen used cars and trucks skyrocket in prices. Do you think this supply crunch is likely to normalize, revert itself? We think that the supply crunch in semiconductors uh, for the auto industry and for other industries too, the, the supply shortage is probably going to persist for the rest of this year. Uh, and that's going to restrain auto production, and it's going to be a headwind for platinum demand, platinum, palladium, rhodium demand for auto catalysts. So we think that that persists for the next six months or so. But we think that at some point over the 2022, you probably see the semiconductor chip industry get itself back in order and the chips become available. And then you start seeing increased auto production and increased demand for PGMs in the auto industry. And last question, electric vehicles. It seems like everywhere I turn, I see ads from basically every single auto, manufac auto manufacturer producing new lineups of electric vehicles due to be released in the next few years. Even Hummer, you know, Hummer, the big Jeeps, <laughs> they're making EVs now. The next, e the next Hummer is going to be an electric one. Mm -hmm. So do you think that analysts have underestimated the growth of EV penetration in the market share for automobiles? I think that analysts at CPM, and when I say that, I mean me personally, because some of my colleagues have been much more bullish about EV market penetration rates than I have been. Uh, uh, I've been very cautious on it. I do think that electric vehicles are coming in and they're going to be taking significant market share over the next 10, 20 years. Uh, but 
Uh, there have been many other analysts at other shops, as well as within CPM Group, uh, who have been much more aggressive in their projections for market penetration of EVs. That is continuing. We're starting to see a little bit of a pullback because people are realizing, hey, the componentry is not there, the electricity is not there, the grid's not there. Uh, you know, so there are constraints in how fast you can move to electric vehicles. But that said, those constraints are falling away, and the market penetration is growing much more rapidly than I had thought and a lot of other people have thought. It probably cannot grow as fast as some of the uh, projections that you're seeing either from governments or politicians or even auto companies, because you start yeah. looking at the auto companies and you say, where's your capacity to produce these cars that fast? And, and it's not there. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Jeff, great thoughts as always. I look forward to speaking with you next time. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. You always have tough questions. <laughs> well, you give, uh, you give knowledgeable responses and need depth analysis. So uh, I thank you for that. Thank you for watching Kiko News. I'm David Lin. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at David Lin underscore TV.